remarks in the comment sections to these videos. And sometimes they push me to really connect with myself. And one of those occasions was this morning when a subscriber was pushing me to uh, explain why I made such a bad deal with the devil. And basically what the scenario is, is that I had a vision of Mephistopheles, literally the devil, 20 years ago. And when that happened, I made the Faustian bargain, which is explained in that video. I, my daughter got involved with Young Life uh, on her 22nd birthday. We had a lovely evening talking and our experiences together in Japan and all these things. And at the end of the evening, just as I'm about to say goodbye to her, she says, Dad, I'm sorry to say this, but I think you're going to hell. I'm still stunned by it. 18 years later, I'm still stunned. You know, who teaches a child to say that to their, their parent? But then I had a visionary experience after this because um, I said goodbye to her, kissed her goodbye, and got in the car and started to drive over here from Washington to my home here. In the course of it, Mephistopheles literally sat down in the passenger seat next to me, the Mephistopheles that I envisioned in Faustus. And I cut the... So you were in hell. Huh? <laughs> so you were in hell. I was in hell. And so I cut the Faustian bargain, which is, I said that Mephistopheles could take my soul on my death, provided that none of my daughters would think that about me for the rest of my life. And my memory of it is that you know, Mephistopheles was actually there in the, in the seat next to me. The experience obviously still moves me and was numinous for me. And one of our subscribers, uh, the last couple of days, started to push on me on that, uh, asking me, you know, why did you make such a bad deal with the devil? Why don't you go back and renegotiate? That really got me to thinking. And so, Here's my response. First of all, the subscriber said, I don't know why you made the particular bargain with your shadow, which was not a well-planned deal, I think. Why don't you make a new fair deal? And I first responded to this. If you're talking about my deal with Mephistopheles, I have no need to change the deal now because I already know the answer. Uh, he then pushed me along and said, that, you know, why can't you negotiate, you know, why don't you take it on as a rational thing? And the problem is that you can't take it on as a rational thing. So, um, and the reason is because it's irrational and because uh, there's no way out while you're in it. I mean, you're just, you're in the situation and you've got to respond to it. And so I don't think your conscious mind can work it out uh, to save you. So let me just read my response then. Um, he was questioning the deal that I made with Mephistopheles, and I certainly I cut a Faustian bargain, no doubt about it. Um, and... Grenade, and the grenade says, is the devil synonymous with the id in this context? I think it probably is. But anyway, let's go on. So here's my response to the doubts about the deal that I made with the devil. I said, that's what I came up with on short notice. When the devil is sitting next to you in a car traveling at 65 miles per hour, there's not necessarily a lot of time to work out the best response. In the fullness of time, after a lot of Jungian study, I know that such psychogenic entities are products of the unconscious caused by emotion. So you can negotiate with them or make them disappear in another way. They are not rational, so you can't negotiate with them rationally. I think we have to assume that my response was instinctual. 
in which the opposite side of my personality knew how to handle the situation in the event, and in effect said to this part of my psyche, be gone. That was also Yahweh's biblical response to the devil. But the difference now is that Dr. Jung pointed out to us that both entities are aspects of the self, and we have to mature out of the fantasy that all of the autonomous ent entities running around in our unconscious are good. As Dr. Jung said, we have to have enough consciousness to examine the spirits and consciously decide. It seems to me that in this particular case, the opposing complex instinctually dealt with the devil. If that had not been the case, that entity could easily have caused me to have a fatal accident under those conditions. Then I said, no, I am not a mental health professional, nor have I ever had a formal psychology course of any kind. So this is my personal conjecture based on 31 years of studying the work of Dr. Jung, but each of us must make our own judgment. When my daughter made that statement to me, it put me into hell right then. It wasn't a question of waiting until death. So in retrospect, I appreciate it because it forced me to find some answers for myself and Dr. Jung's writing saved me. Remember what Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. That dictum worked for me, though it has taken me 20 years to fully grok that situation to my satisfaction. In some ways, I'm like Ronnie Reagan, who tells us on television ads that he's not afraid of burning in hell. The trouble is, hell manifests here on earth, and I'm sure he's been through it too but he just doesn't understand the metaphor and what religious leaders and adepts of all time were saying. Indeed, it's probably true that a lot of them didn't understand what they were saying either, although many did. Yesterday, I was reading in Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Volume 2, and I found an essay talking about Dr. Jung's work from an Indian perspective which pointed out that the ideas of God and the devil being in the unconscious was written about in the Upanishads more than 2,000 years ago. Christians have been misguided by the church to look up for God for millennia when we should have been told to look within. Remember when the, remember when the NFL football player points at the sky after a touchdown He's pointing in the wrong direction. He should be pointing at his heart instead, because it was his self that gave him the talent and strength to get him across the goal line, not some magical puppeteer in the far reaches of the universe. Thank you for pushing me along on this. When I write like this, I am in the flow. So what comes out comes directly from myself to the words on the screen and therefore represents the truth from my point of view. Okay, so that was my response and I would love to hear or see some comments that any of you might have on it. This was the uh, cover that I had on um, on the video just now, why is Elijah pointing in the wrong direction? And so you might think of that when you think of um, the NFL football player. This is why we all think that pointing up is the right answer, because in Christianity at least, and I can't speak for other religions, um, Everybody's always pointing up, and uh, here's a stained glass w window that proves it, um, because here's an angel pointing up, and this is why religions have gotten in, in problems, uh, particularly in the last, uh, I guess, 150 years particularly, but since uh, 1500, as Dr. Edinger said at one point, uh, 
you know, since 1500, God has fallen out of heaven and into the psyche of man. And Dr. Jung said something to the effect, um, when God fell off the roof of the cathedral, blah, blah, blah. And so the point is that um, God is not up there. God is in here. And that's a point that we all need to understand better uh, and how to deal with that in our lives. Um, so anyway, are there any thoughts about this video and my response to it? But how does one maintain humility if they think themselves as a God? I struggled with this. If they put God above them or reinforced humility for better or worse. Um, well, I agree with that. And so did Dr. Young. In fact, that's one of the last things he says in this book, in answer to Job. Um, and I probably can quote that precisely here uh, because it's almost the last thing he says. Um, so, so this is actually in the very last paragraph of Answer to Job, paragraph 758. Uh, Dr. Jung says, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the third divine person in man, brings about a Christification of many, and the question then arises whether these many are all complete God-men. Such a transformation would lead to insufferable collisions between them, to say nothing of the unavoidable inflation to which the ordinary mortal, who is not freed from original sin, would instantly succumb. In these circumstances, it is well to remind ourselves of St. Paul and his split consciousness. On one side, he felt he was the apostle directly called and enlightened by God, and on the other side, a sinful man who could not pluck out the thorn in the flesh and rid himself of the satanic angel who plagued him. That is to say, even the enlightened person remains what he is, and is never more than his own limited ego before the one who dwells within him, whose form has no knowable boundaries, who encompasses him on all sides, fathomless as the abysms of the earth and vast as the sky. So I think I agree with you, uh, or not, that... Um, in dealing with with archaic men over the last two millennia, uh, it probably did make sense for the church to point up as a way of uh, maintaining humility. Uh, but as Dr. Young says, there are different there are different ways of looking at it whose form has no knowable boundaries, who encompasses him on all sides, fathomless as the abysms of the earth and vast as the sky. So God is everywhere. And, um, you know, just because you can't see it doesn't mean you shouldn't maintain humility. Uh, the other thing I wanted to read about um, and I've, I've read this a little bit before, but um, I wrote a book in 2009. It's called Tsunami of Blood, and as you see, it has my name on the dust cover and um, my picture in the jacket. <laughs> and so in Chapter 5 of my book, um, I'm talking about... Um, terror management theory, okay? So here's what I say, and I'm going to quote Dr. Sheldon Solomon, who's a professor of psychology at uh, Skidmore College. Um, So here's how Sheldon defined TM terror management theory in our interview. Sheldon, 
Terror management theory was originally derived from the ideas of Ernest Becker, who in the 1970s wrote a series of books in which he claimed that the uniquely human awareness of death has a great deal to do with just about everything that human beings do day to day. His argument is that people are the only creatures that are smart enough to recognize that we're here and if you know that you're here, you also recognize that you won't always be around. On top of that, we realize that we will die someday and that our deaths can occur at any time for reasons that we could never anticipate or control. We also recognize that we're animals and that whether we like it or not, we're no more significant than lizards or potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> According to Becker, all these realizations would give rise to potentially debilitating terror, but for the fact that human beings rather cleverly, although not necessarily consciously, solved this existential dilemma by the creation and maintenance of what anthropologists today call culture. Becker's point was that human beings construct cultural worldviews, beliefs that we share with other people in our groups that essentially give us a sense that we are individuals of value in a world of meaning. When we have those beliefs, when we confidently subscribe to a belief that we have meaning and value, that in turn, that in turn gives us a sense that we can live forever either literally in the context of different religions that provide the hope for an afterlife, or symbolically just the idea that tangible representations of our culture will remain nevertheless. So then I said, uh, you're calling it terror management theory? Were you calling it that before 9-11, Sheldon? Yes, absolutely. So anyway. That, that's just a brief quote from my book, Tsunami of Blood, uh, which was written in 2007 or published in 2007 for uh, those that might have interest.